We read the Word of God in our worship service now from Genesis chapter 4. Genesis 4. Our text is taken from the fourth verse of this chapter. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. The word Cain in the Hebrew means gotten. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process, in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be its desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he builded a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. And unto Enoch was born Irad. And Irad begat Mahujael, and Mahujael begat Methusiel, and Methusiel begat Lamech. And Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of the one was Ada, which means adorned, and the name of the other Zillah, which means shady. And Ada bare Jabal. He was the father of such as dwell in tents, and of such as have cattle. And his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all such as handle the harp and organ. And Zillah, she bare Tubal-Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. And the sister of Tubal-Cain was Naamah. And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding, and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech 
seventy and sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. So far we read from God's word. In verse 4 of Genesis 4, we read, And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. We, with this sermon, begin a series of about seven sermons that will take us past our commemoration of the death of the Lamb of God. And we will be looking at different passages of Scripture that identify Jesus as the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world, as John the Baptist said. He's also the Lamb that stands identified in the book of Revelation. For many times, even in that book, way after his death, Jesus is identified as the lamb that stands as it were slain or the lamb that is the light of the heaven to come. So even in glory, there will be a way to identify Jesus as the lamb of God. We consider the reference in our text to the firstlings of the flock the firstlings of the flock as a reference to a lamb. And we use this as the first in this series that considers Jesus as the suffering lamb of God. There are not many historical events that receive biblical attention. In the first 1,500 years, the flood took place approximately 1,500 years after creation. That this incident that there was a sacrifices on the part of Abel and Cain, and that Cain killed Abel, indicates, and that that's recorded, one of the events of those 1,500 years full of events, that that's recorded indicates to us something of its importance. This incident does make us aware of what God said right at the beginning of biblical history in that which is called the mother promise in Genesis 3 verse 15. There, when God said there would be enmity in the human race, that they would not all be united in enmity against God, as the fall into sin had done, they were all united in Adam, both in righteousness and then in sin. But by making a division and making enmity between parts of the seed of Adam, we see here a classic evidence of that enmity taking place. But we also see something else in this incident, and that is that sacrificing of animals or of the fruit of the ground, but just the practice of sacrificing was something that had become rather regular and commonplace. 
we read at the end of chapter 4 that God gave to Adam and Eve Seth, and Eve identified Seth as one whom God had given to her instead of Abel. So we know that, a that Seth was born shortly after the death of Abel. If you look in chapter 5 and in the genealogy, you find in chapter 5, verse 5, that Adam was 130 years from creation when Seth was born. So the world has been in existence when this incident takes place for 125 to 130 years. And even though we only read of Cain and then Abel and then Seth, there had to have been many others, children, grandchildren, and undoubtedly great-grandchildren. So there's all kinds of population. Cain was afraid of others who, when they would find him, would execute him because of what he did to Abel. So the world is rather populated already. And Cain knows that he's going to have to be a fugitive and a vagabond. He's going to have to be away from where most of the people had gathered together. So, taking place about 125 to 130 years after creation is this incident. An incident that takes place between two brothers who have been around for quite a while. They know each other very well. They're brothers. In fact, there are some commentators who would say well, they were twins. And the reason why they would say that is because we don't read about Abel that Eve conceived again and bare Abel. We read she conceived and bare Cain and immediately and she again bare his brother. Whether they were twins or not is really... Not that's important. They were very much together. They were raised together. They were taught together. They saw the cherubim with the flaming sword. They were aware of the Garden of Eden. They were told by Adam and Eve of the history. They knew that in the center of that garden was the tree of life, in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were taught about the communications that God had given and what it was like to walk in the cool of the garden before sin. They were taught about the fall. They were taught about the promises that God gave. They were equally taught. Born of believing parents, who received the same instruction. But so very different. Their difference can be identified not only from the incident that takes place, but from two passages of Scripture in the New Testament. In the familiar passage of Hebrews 11, verse 4, we read that Abel exercised himself in faith. And he had the witness from God that he was righteous. He had a witness from God that he was righteous. Powerful. The New Testament also tells us about Cain. In 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, John is writing as he does repeatedly throughout this first letter about the need to love one another, and he finishes verse 11 speaking of that, and then he references Cain in, chapter, in verse 12, not as Cain, and now notice the way Cain is identified, 
who was of that wicked one. He was of that wicked one, the wicked Satan, and slew his brother. And then this is interesting. We get into the heart of Cain. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. He slew Abel out of jealousy because he knew his were bad and Abel's works were righteous. So they may have been raised together, born of the same parents, received the same instruction, brothers, possibly twins, but they were so very different spiritually. And when you go back to Genesis 3, verse 15, then you'd have to say, one was of the seed of the woman, and the other was of the seed of the serpent. There's where the hatred, enmity, was going to be between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Cain brought a sacrifice. Cain brought a sacrifice, as did Abel. They had learned about sacrificing. When God taught Adam and Eve about forgiveness of the guilt and covering of the shame. Just a quick parenthesis. Every sin incurs guilt, liability to be punished, guilty conscience, I know I deserve to be punished, and shame. God provided for Adam and Eve covering for both. Cain and Abel learned about sacrificing from Adam and Eve, who learned about sacrificing from God. Let's trace it. It has to do with covering. Sacrifices cover. Now let's go back and begin. The last verse of Genesis chapter 2 describes Adam and Eve's innocency. Innocency before God and innocency before each other this way. Striking. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Their righteousness as they stood before God is described as unashamed nakedness. The immediate effect of their sin, Genesis 2, verse, 3, verse 7, their eyes were opened. They both were opened. And they knew that they were naked. Now, they knew they were naked before, but now they were fully conscious of that nakedness, and there was shame. And so... They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings of aprons. But that was insufficient because the next verse says, Genesis 2, 3, verse 8, when they heard God coming, they knew that the coverings they put on were not adequate. And so they made an effort to talk about the deceit of sin and, and the folly. You almost want to grin. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Right. God sees. God knows. But they knew what they had put on, the fig leaves, was not adequate to cover them. 
So when God said to Adam his question, Where out thou art thou? Adam answered, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. God dropped that subject, apparently. He went to the promise of Genesis 3, verse 15. The woman will have a seed which will crush the head of the serpent. Then God proceeded to announce the punishments that their sin would receive, their sins would receive in their lives. But then God gave to them a covering. God drove them out of the garden, but God also immediately gave them a covering. Verse 21 of Genesis 3. Adam, first, after God stopped talking, Adam heard in God's promise that his wife would bear children. He didn't know that before. So he immediately identifies her with a name. She was just one of his rib. Until then, Adam called his wife's name Eve because now she was going to have seed and she is the mother of all living. Not just living physically, but of living, real living. There's a, there's a hope. Real li- Remember what life is? We had it this morning. Real life is to know God. And Adam heard in that promise that that seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, that that would be the end of the serpent, death, but it would bring life, real life. So he calls her Eve, mother of the living. And then we read this in Genesis 3.21. Adam also and his wife, unto Adam and his wife, did Jehovah God make coats of skin. Coats of skins and clothed them. Not only would the skins, animal skins, be far more durable than the fig leaves, but God said this is the better covering. The better covering. Why? And now listen carefully. Real covering of sin requires the shedding of blood. Where did God get animal skins? The only place that God could have gotten an animal skin is off an animal that had to die. An innocent animal had to have its blood shed And it forfeited its life to provide in its skins covering for the nakedness of Adam and Eve. So God's provision of animal skins implies the first sacrifice. It implies it. Adam, Eve, Cain and Abel learned about sacrificing. Just the practice of sacrificing. Abel, being righteous, knew what kind of sacrifice was needed. They learned that. And they had to have learned it from the provision of God in the coats of skins. And there can be no doubt, no doubt at all, that that skin or skins which were used to cover Adam and Eve, and then their children and their children's children, was the coats of the skins of a lamb. Not only because that's what righteous Abel used, but also because that's 
God's command about sacrifices. Yes, bullocks and goats, but the firstlings of the flock, sheep, and the firstlings, a lamb. Before we go on, let's look just a little bit more at the idea of a sacrifice. In Leviticus 17, there is something that's quoted that we find in Hebrews 9. Let me read it from Hebrews 9, verse 22. Almost all things are by the law, the law of Moses, purged with blood. They're cleaned by blood. All things are cleansed by blood, death. And then it goes on. Without shedding of blood is no remission. Forgiveness. Forgiveness purges. Adam and Eve sinned. They became aware of their sinfulness by being aware of their nakedness. To cover, they needed the punishment, the guilt taken away, and the shame covered. God made it clear in the teaching of His law and in the death of the Savior that sin earns the penalty. The penalty, the guilt, means death. Guilt earns death. The wages of sin, Romans 6.23, is death. And so God was showing in a powerful way. Here's Adam and Eve. They just received the, the announcement of all these punishments that would be theirs. And, and then God immediately turns around and they watch an innocent sheep or being killed. And the skin's taken off of them. And we may believe burning of the rest. That animal, innocent, didn't do anything wrong, sacrificed its life. And the skins were used to coat Adam and Eve. The one who brings a bloody sacrifice was taught, you have to be aware that when you sacrifice, you are making confession. And the reality of the confession of sin is that you are admitting you know what you did wrong deserves. Namely, if I sin, I don't just deserve a spanking. I don't have to just go sit in a corner. My sin, every single one of them, deserves my death. I deserve to die. My life be taken. My blood shed. Now some of us are more sensitive for that than others. But, but imagine watching your little lamb. Think of a pet that has to die in your place. You see and experience the reality of sin and what sin earns. And so the sight of that dying lamb emphasizes in the mind of the sacrificer the need for genuine sorrow and something to take my place because of what I did wrong. A sacrifice with the shedding of blood speaks, I am sorry. 
that I brought death. Now Adam, Eve, Abel, and all those who sacrificed afterwards correctly were well aware that, that those animals, whether it was bullocks or rams or turtle doves or lambs, really didn't cover in God's eyes. They knew that. They knew that it was all a picture. A picture of what the seed of the woman would have to do in order to crush the head of the serpent. Usually we think, crush the head of the serpent, a big guy, he's going to just slaughter that little animal. The sacrifice said, no. The only way you can crush the serpent is that he, you have to die. Now, Cain and Abel brought a sacrifice. Cain and Abel knew guilt. It's not just the righteous who experience guilt and shame. Ungodly know guilt and shame as well. Knowing both of them, that they stood before their creator, their creator God, guilty. They wanted to bring something to appease, to earn his favor. Now listen carefully. Cain's determined his sacrifice, his offering, on the basis of his occupation. Cain determined his offering on the basis of his occupation. Abel determined his occupation on the basis of his offering. They all were farmers. You didn't keep sheep for the meat. That's not until Genesis 9 when God said you may eat. They were all vegetarians until then. Cain determined what he was going to offer on the basis of this is my job. This is my occupation. I'm going to bring the first, uh, the, the, the fruits of the land. Abel said, God wants sacrifices for sin. I am a sinner. I need a lot of sacrifices. I am going to be a shepherd. His occupation was determined by his knowledge of his need for sacrifices. And Abel's sacrifice revealed that he knew what his sin deserved. Blood, death, therefore blood. So he took the best, the hope of a larger herd, he took the first, he took the best, and he said, I have to show what my sins deserve. And he slaughtered it. And he burnt it as a sacrifice. But again, he, did, he knew that that sacrifice of all of those animals didn't do it. And so we read in, Genesis, in Hebrews 11, verse 4, By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice by faith. He knew those sheep and those firstlings didn't do it. He knew where the finger of those sheep was pointing. And he, by his faith, was pointing to some 
something that was going to come. He didn't have the fullness of the concept yet. God was revealing it slowly, but he knew there was more and the better to come. And by faith, he grabbed a hold of that promise. Cain knew sin too. He knew his own. He needed, knew he needed to appease an angry God. He sacrificed. But he didn't follow God's pattern. He didn't heed God's instruction. But instead, he thought to earn God's favor and appease him with the works of his hands, the product of his field, the fruits of his occupation. God should be happy when I give him my best works. That should pay for all my past transgressions. I do something wrong, then I'm going to try to earn his favor by doing something nice. And the next time I do something wrong, I'm going to have to work harder to earn some points to get ahead because I lost some over here. Now I've got to earn some to get his favor. Here, Lord, look at my beautiful vegetables. Look at my beautiful fruit. Look at what I have done to overcome the curse that came on the ground through Adam. This is the product of sweat and tears. Be happy, Lord. I gave you my best. That was Cain. Verse 5. Unto Cain and to his offering, God had not respect. Unto Cain and his offering, God had not respect. And again, 1 Timothy 3, I'm sorry, 1 John 3, verse 12. Wherefore slew he him because he got the testimony, his works were evil and his brother's righteous. He knew that in spite of giving his best, he still was the object of God's anger and wrath. And that made it worse. And then what made it even worse? First he did his best and that wasn't good enough. And then, and then, and then there's that rotten brother of mine who gets God's favor. Jealousy, anger, frustration. Mine, God says, aren't good. And his are. Wherefore slew he him? Because his own were evil and his brothers were righteous. But Abel, Hebrews 11 verse 4, obtained witness. Obtained witness. We can guess to how God, 125 years after creation, revealed and indicated very obviously to these two men that he received one and didn't another. We can guess, but that's useless. But they both knew and received testimony. They received a witness from God that one sacrifice was not good, bad, evil, and the other was good and received. Abel received the testimony from God that his was received with favor. And Abel knew, if my sacrifice is received with divine favor, then I am received with divine favor. Now that's an amazing thing. The sacrifice received favor, 
And that means I have received. I am righteous. I stand before the maker of heaven and earth, the one against whom my sins were committed. I stand before him, and he receives me with favor. Even though I deserve from him the punishment, I receive his favor. And that can only be because he makes a judgment about me that I am right in his sight. Righteous. He knew he was innocent. But he also knew, again, that it wasn't because of the, the firstlings of the flock, but that one who is pictured in the firstlings of the flock. He didn't identify him yet as the Lamb of God. We can. But he, by what a faith, to take what little revelation, but so clear revelation God had given, and he stood before God, humble and grateful. Humble and grateful. I deserve this, but God says this. And that's what we have to learn. So that as we stand before God ourselves, it was still 4,000 years before Jesus would die for Abel. If we look back 2,000 years, we see that the lamb that God provided was his own son. We know that the power of the death of nothing less than the Son of God did the work of taking away the penalty and covering the shame for all of our sin. It is easy for us to simply now to say, okay, beloved, he did it. By faith, take a hold of that. The difficulty arises because of the human natures we have and the relationships that we often have with each other. Because in our human nature, the relationship that we have with others is if they're nice to me, then I'm going to be nice to them. And if they're not nice to me, then I'm not going to be so nice to them. So, my relationship with other people is determined by whether they're nice, they're good, whether they do good works. And, and then I'm going to do that with God. If it works with people, then it has to work with God. I might lose some points, but let me gain some points. I'll do the honeydew jar. I'll gain some points, and then I'll do that with God, and I'll give him my... Somebody points out our sin. Yep. But, but what about all the other times I did it right? Sure, I might have broken the, the speed limit, but I did it. I mean, 40 other times I don't drive that road, and I did it good. Just a crazy example of how we think. And then how we think about ourselves as we stand before God. And that's why we fall into this terrible gorge. It's not a ditch. It's a gorge that ends in psychological death. And that gorge is this. I am because of what I've done or not done. Instead of I am who I am because of the grace of God in providing a covering. I didn't, don't, 
and will never deserve. But it's such a covering that it is perfect for all my past, present sinfulness and all my, it'll cover everything. Faith in the Lamb says, I know I can't appease God. None of my sins can be covered. None of my nakedness can be covered by what I do. But by faith, I take what God did for me. Now, if you believe that, then you live that way. And you live in that consciousness. This is who you are. And then, that's how we look at each other. That's not only the way I have to look at myself. That's the way I, it's not whether you're nice to me or bad to me or, and hurt me. That's not how I'm going to have a... No, the relationship is determined by what God has done for me in Christ. He's made the sacrifice. I didn't give anything. He gave his own son for us all. Believe and live out of that faith. Amen. Our Father, we thank thee. Again, thy marvelous word shows us the marvelous sacrifice of the Lamb. Innocent, perfect, the best, but nothing we can offer, and it's all of thee. Thanks for such a sacrifice for us.